get started. Um, good right. evening. Awesome. Here we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Haitian American Museum of Chicago's program tonight, The Era of Papa Doc. This program is a part of Dr. Cranston Knight's lecture series at the museum, where he speaks about conversations surrounding Haiti and the Haitian diaspora. My name is Carlos Bossard, and I'm the executive director of the museum. It's great to see you all this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Hammock's mission is to promote Haitian art, culture, and history in metropolitan Chicago and surrounding communities nationally and internationally through advocacy, education, and supportive services. Education is at the core of our mission, and we are glad to continue bringing insightful, meaningful, and impactful lectures and programs to the community. Before we begin, I would like to do a little bit of housekeeping and let you all know the format of tonight's event. First, this program is being recorded, and if you do not wish to be seen on the recording, feel free to turn your video cameras off now. Also, all of you are automatically put on mute as you enter the room. Please make sure to remain on mute throughout the program to ensure everyone can hear Dr. Knight clearly. Additionally, auto-generated captioning has been turned on for accessibility. If you do need the transcript at the end, please feel free to reach out and make that available to you. And lastly, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session with Dr. Knight, moderated by Hammock's educator and grant writer, Ben Henderson. Ben has been with the museum for over two years now and continues to be a huge asset, supporter, and friend of the museum. Ben. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Henderson, and I'm the educator and grant writer at the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. As Carl stated, the Q&A will take place after the presentation. However, feel free to put your questions in the chat during the presentation. During the Q&A session, all questions must be made through the chat. I'll be monitoring questions throughout and relaying them to Dr. Knight. For those who haven't been to our previous programs with Dr. Knight, uh, Dr. Cranston Ramirez Knight got his PhD from Loyola University in History. His work primarily focuses on international relations, foreign policy, and with emphasis on smaller states like Haiti. On the side, Dr. Knight is a photographer and works with Hammock as a historian and consultant. For today's program, he'll be discussing the era of pop doc the consequential period in which Francois de Valier ruled over Haiti as a dictator. Dr. Knight will be discussing how de Valier came to power and the consequences that this dark period has on Haiti. This is the eighth in a series that explores global affairs, history, and culture from African and African diasporic perspectives. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Knight. It's good to be here. Um, the era that we are currently going to look at is um, the time in which Papa Doc comes to uh, his own, which is to say that here's an individual who is in Haiti. Uh, his, he was, his parents were from Martinique. They arrived in um, Haiti where he was born. Uh, Duvalier always wanted to be a physician and so eventually he went to medical school in Haiti. Eventually he came to the United States and at the United, in the United States he participated in a number of programs to eradicate various diseases in areas where uh, American soldiers were going to be. So things like y'all smallpox, he was extremely good at being able to have a conversation. He was very good at working with the poor. And when he left the United States, he then went back to Haiti where he continued on to become um, head of public health. And he stayed in that position for a number of years working with a, a number of individuals, with a number of individuals uh, in the hospitals, working with the poor there. And eventually he became, I won't use the word radicalized, but he most certainly was changed with the US invasion in 1915. That invasion really had a tremendous impact, not only on, not only on him, but those Haitians who were coming of age as the Americans were installing new types of governments which were alien to Haiti. And when I say alien, Traditionally, your presidents came, presidents came from a military class. 
once the Americans arrived, they changed that. There'd always been some issues between dark-skinned Haitians and most certainly those who were mulattoes. But once the Americans arrived, they inflated that situation such that no dark-skinned individuals could ever become president. Normally, individuals became president by first entering the military, and then from the military, which was a long tradition going all the way back to the revolution, those individuals became president. When Americans arrived, they disbanded the military, and we created a military that would be supportive of the United States. And it's from that military class which is, which, in which the Creoles, those individuals, were allowed to become president. And what it created post-American intervention was a tremendous uproar. So like I said, in 1920, uh, which is even before the Americans left, uh, there were a number of riots, which the Americans put down brutally. People were not happy over the fact that those individuals who were dark could not enter into politics, could not hold um, particular jobs, only those who were very light skinned. And so very early on, 1920, 1930, you begin to have a shift in, a, in the policy of individuals who were beginning to say, well, where do we stand? Is Haiti that particular place whereby we will become that shining light, which historically we had had and said that there should be revolutions. Therefore, you should look at the Haitian revolution and, and try to replicate it. Or should we turn inward and recreate an entirely new paradigm whereby those individuals who are dark skinned should be able to hold the reins of power. And that, new paradigm, that new philosophy, there was one very similarly nice, it's called Negritude. Uh, Langston Hughes was part of that movement, um, very similar to the Garvey movement in which in Haiti, people begin to see a relationship between themselves and Africa. Voodoo then became very, very important. It was no longer simply a religion, it became a political statement which said we are African. This is what ties us to Africa. We are an African people. And so you begin to get lots of poets, novelists, writers, creating a new political theory in which they maintained that the Blacks should be the individuals who ran the country and the enemy of those individuals at the bottom, meaning those with dark skin, they should run the country. What made this particular philosophy different was the fact that it called for a strong person. So it, not to say that it was eugenics because it was not. It had some tenets of eugenics, had some tenets of Marxism, although they were very anti-communist. So it had been very anti-Lenin and most certainly Stalin and Trotsky, but they had some elements of Marx's works and whereby they're looking at the poor and maintaining that it's the poor who should be the individuals who should not only run the country, but should, should bear the fruits of labor from their works. And so that, that transformative philosophy was one that Duvalier and other intellectuals of his time followed through. When you look at Duvalier's climb to political prominence. He followed that philosophy all the way through. He never deviated from it, meaning that those individuals who were at the bottom of the ladder should always be at the top. And that's, they, they blamed those individuals who were light skinned as being the enemy of the state and believed that those individuals did not have the right to hold political power. And that at some point in time that they should be, whether it was through assassination, whether it was by uh, losing their job, it's those individuals who should hold the reins of power. And he doesn't change that. That, that philosophy 
continues on straight through when, until he becomes president of Haiti. That type of philosophy, which called for the strong man. So when individuals were looking at originally at Haiti and said, well, he, when he wants to become president, when he wants to become president for life, that was abnormal. That was not traditional Haitian. And it wasn't because individuals usually ran for one term. But when you follow the philosophy that was being created during the 30s and particularly during the 40s, and this philosophy said that really you should have a strong individual that should run the state and always be over the state, is literally following the dogma which had been created after the American intervention. So he's not strained from the philosophy. He's not the individual who is creating something new by hurting his uh, many individuals who oppose him, that was part of the doctrine that he and others had created. When he comes to power and he creates the Tutamakuts, he made sure that those individuals came from the lower class. He made sure that they were the poor because he really believed that it's the poor who should be the individuals that would not only run the country, but those individuals who would keep him in power. So he takes the power, a lot of power away from the military and he gives it to the Tutamakuts. That changed Haitian history from that day to this day because um, the individuals who were part of the administrative class, i.e. those individuals who were light-skinned, set off on a number of rebellions against him. And of course, they were summarily executed. Uh, what this particular one shows, the coup of 1949, um, this is Duvalier's actual entry into politics. He had decided that he was going to run and um, he backed this particular military uh, general. Uh, unfortunately, he was overthrown in a coup and had to go into hiding. And that's a, a photo of the individual who was in power at the time, who eventually uh, he loses uh, his candidacy and Duvalier announces his and decides that he's going to run to become president of the country. Next slide, please. So uh, on his campaign, Duvalier promised to rebuild and renew the country. Um, he understood rural Haiti because as a physician, that's exactly where he's at. He's down there with the people, the, the, the disease, uh, yellow fever, uh, one particular one called Yah, um, was devastating the population. He was one of the few physicians willing to actually go into the uh, poor communities in Haiti and help eradicate this very debilitating disease. Um, it was bacterial caused. At the time, they did not have penicillin. They was using some heavy metal. He uh, used some natural herbs along with some of the Western medicine and was able to get great results. And, and, as, and consequently, the individuals who he worked with and most certainly helped to become well, uh, held allegiance to him. They had quite a bit of an affection for him. And he maintained that. So such that in 57, when he did run for president, they didn't forget him. So he won really by overwhelming majority of votes. Next, please. <clears throat> um, this is uh, Duvalier's looking at the issue of Africanness and the intellectuals of the time made a distinction between those who were Marxists and those individuals who were Africanists and the Africanists are looking at how does Haiti play into the larger diaspora of Africanness? What does it mean to be Black? What does it mean to be Haitian and Black? What does it mean when we, for, for scholars of that time, who are writing stories, for painters, for artists, let's bring those individuals in so that we can have uh, a new progressive nation, that those individuals will be the vanguard of what he considered to be a Black revolution that would literally change Haitian culture forever. In essence, he maintained that those individuals 
who had done the investigation, had done the critiques, had found those individuals who were in his mind were the soul of Haiti, who was the poor, it was, would be those individuals who would carry out this new um, revolution, and it would be those individuals who would come to power. Next, please. Um, as I had mentioned before, <clears throat> the American uh, intervention really had tremendous, uh, a tremendous impact on Duvalier and, and others. And um, he was a founding follower of, 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 of a particular group. And unfortunately, my, my Haitian is, for, I'm sorry, my French is rather bad. Um, but basically what this group was looking at was traditional African institutions. And as I stated, looking at those who were poets, storytellers, magicians, magicians, and others who could tell the stories of African tribes and what it meant to be, uh, what it meant to be black. And for them, it, and also for Americans, it's those individuals who lived in Ethiopia. For a long time, Ethiopia was considered to be the center and the heart of Africa. So they're looking at what's going on in Ethiopia. How can we be more Ethiopian-like? Because that is the truest of being an African. And he formed a group uh, called the Grots, and they, they, these are the, these are, would become the middle class, doctors, lawyers, and teachers. And Voodoo, which had existed in Haiti, then became a central feature of Haitian life. It had already been, but now they're looking at it and contextualize it, racializing it, and saying that it is all not simply a religion, but it is what it means to be African. Next, please. <clears throat> there is also a schism and uh, more than simply being French and African, um, the question becomes, what is the essence of being an African? What's the, what's the essence of being an authentic Black Haitian? And once again, they said, if we look at the poor, the dis disenfranchised populace, it is those individuals that we need to look at and look at very seriously. And Haiti was not the only place that was really looking at this type of paradigm. It also took place in the United States. It also will take place, and that is within the Black community, within the United States and the Black communities in the South, where intellectuals in the North, like Langston Hughes, Tommy Tuner, are looking at the, the roots of Africanness, and they're saying pretty much the same thing. What changes this whole situation for them in terms of uh, determination of uh, that is uh, to move away from what it means to be a liberal or liberalism, which they maintain is primarily something that is white, is the fact that they're looking at the concept of the autocratic Blacks. It is those Blacks who have the right to rule. And those individuals who are mulattoes are literally the enemy of the state. So what comes in very early in this whole concept of radicalization of blackness for these particular individuals who Duvalier uh, worked with, studied with, did critiques was the autocrat. That was the person that would lead the poor to power. Next, please. This is simply some, uh, some of Duvalier's writings. He did a uh, fair amount. In fact, I was really surprised of how much writing he actually did. But he maintained that the black middle class should declare his power and overthrow the elite mulatto uh, hegemon. So he was very clear who the enemy of the state was, and he was very clear who should hold power. Next, please. This is just the references. Uh, I had to do a tremendous amount of research to look at Duvalier and to look at um, the type of philosophy that was being followed and carried out throughout the island. Um, the political violence, which is going to take place, was primarily from that elite that he considered to be uh, the enemy of the state. So you will have individuals who will come from the United States who had, uh, some of them had actually been in the Tuskegee, had been part of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, they're going to take a, find a boat, come into Haiti, and attempt to overthrow the government. 
and they were summarily killed. Some will flee to Cuba uh, and then come back to Haiti and try to carry out the Cuban experiment in terms of trying to overthrow the government. They too were summarily killed. And so as far as those individuals who ran the state were concerned, anyone who tried to overthrow the autocrat, and this, this person was considered to be the genuine person of African descent, was summarily killed. So when we look at the violence which takes place at, in Haiti under Duvalier, he's simply following an ideology that had been set in place during the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. And he continues that philosophy right up to his, literally, it's, it's uh, finite. And by the time he comes to power and becomes president. There's been, of course, much critique on the issue in terms of why so many people were killed and lots of people were killed. Uh, no one can get away from that. But was there a reason for that killing other than arbitrary? And the answer was yes, there was. Uh, Donnie, were they, were they considered to be enemy of the state, but they were mulatto. And as I had discussed earlier, this issue of being pure, as far as he was concerned, he was getting rid of those individuals who were unpure, who could possibly come back and take Haiti from its blackness and move it into a liberal area of whiteness. So he's making some very clear distinctions. By the time that the United States has put an embargo on Haiti under Kennedy, uh, without question, those individuals who have followed him see whites as the enemy and anyone who's following those individuals as being the enemy of the state and therefore they were liquidated. Uh, I'd like to open it up for, uh, I know I talked a lot, a, a lot, but at some point I want to open it up for discussion. Uh, color was seen as the most important uh, determinant of political life in the country and politics was, was, was to be class struggle. So they took a little bit of the Marxism and they pull it together and say, this is the enemy of the state and these individuals aren't. These individuals have the right to hold power and these individuals don't. And so uh, as we look at the impact of the French and the Creole class, that's the class that he wants to get rid of. That's the class that's the enemy. And what he wants is a black middle class. It would be those individuals who would define the state, which is very much like Marxism in one sense. The difference, once again, being the fact that you have this individual who would be the strong person. And so what does Duvalier do? Uh, he does build uh, uh, communities. He, he builds for them uh, labor unions. He builds for them uh, um, a legislative branch that allows them to enter into the politics in Haiti, which is something that they have been denied under those individuals who were mulatto. Is there, an, I'm not sure if there's a next page or not. Um, but he most certainly wanted to build a black middle class and that became, that became one of his major, major points that he carried through right until his death. So because I was, you know, discussing this particular philosophy. Um, I really, really like to hear back uh, because very often we don't talk about the issue of what was called negritude during that particular time, which was very strong in the United States, but it was also very strong in Haiti. And we'd like to know your comments, your feedback, uh, anything that could add to that, this particular conversation. All right. So we're starting the Q&A now. Um, feel free to put your questions in. And we've already got one. Um, did Duvalier try to demolish the upper middle class so the middle class would be the top class? Okay, I'm trying to understand the question. Let me rephrase that. I, I, missed, um, I, I misread something, okay? Uh, did Duvalier try to demolish the upper class so the middle class would um, become the top class? Okay, so... He's coming from a Marxist perspective. And for him, the middle class were, were doctors and lawyers and teachers. They were not the super rich. 
So yes, he wants to demolish that upper, that upper super rich class, which was, was mulatto. He wanted to just completely destroy it. And he wanted that the middle class to be the individuals that ran the country. So yes, he wanted to demolish them. Okay. In fact, he did. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So I guess I'll take it. I'll take my chance for a question now. Um, so how did colorism merge in Haiti, basically? Um, how did um, this, uh, how, how did uh, the mulatto class kind of took over political power in Haiti, Haiti for such a long time? And why did it took, and why did a guy like de Valier hate them so much? Uh, colorism had been in Haiti for a very long period of time. I mean, from the time that the French had been there. Um, uh, and we see it play out a lot in the United States when the, um, as, a, as the Haitian revolution is raging and the French bring, who, who had plantations are escaping and come to New Orleans. For them, um, the mulattoes, particularly mulatto women, were the most beautiful women there was. The question becomes, well, why mulattoes? Well, unlike the British who believed in segregation, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese believed in miscegenation. In essence, if they could have enough children over generations, the, the dark skin will simply disappear. Now, it was a theory, of course, it doesn't, doesn't work that way, but that's what they believed. The British believed in segregation, which is why the slavery was different in the United States. So you find segregation in the United States, you find it in Rhodesia, you see it, you find it in, in uh, the apartheid laws in South Africa, you find it in New Zealand, you find it in Australia. Very different view of how they interacted with not only the slave population, but the indigenous population within those countries. So from the very beginning, mulattoes played an important role in terms of a caste system between those individuals who were dark, those individuals light, and those individuals who ran the country, who at the time were French. So the whites are at the top, the people who are light skinned are in the middle, and the dark skinned people filter down to the bottom base. That had been a long history. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because a lot of things like I read about the Haitian Revolution and all that stuff is that um, you had the, the free class of colors, basically, color that was mostly a mixed race that were very protective of what their status and they yeah. kind of were sort of jealous of, you know, that uh, this guy, Bo that, you know, black slaves were kind of sort of taking the credit for the revolution, so. Yeah, and that's, and a lot of that is, uh, is a result of the French and in terms of, of how, you know, even in the military, uh, the, those individuals who, hold, who, hold, who could hold command um, because, because the French do, does create a military that is integrated in with their own military, a lot of times they were mulatto class and those individuals could hold rank, they were part of the mulatto class. Now the real question, they are of African descent, but they're of mixed race. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, was was Duvalier in conversation with many Gold Coast politicians aiming for independence from colonial rule? I uh, assume that, I'm assuming that she's talking about like West Africa, uh, like Ghana and all that stuff. I mean, later when he comes to power? Yes, uh, during the period of decolonization after. No, other than Ethiopia, when Haile Selassie came, uh, no. Okay. Um, yeah, here's another question. Um, Dark-skinned Haitians couldn't serve in the military? The military, yeah. Uh, they did serve in the military. And uh, uh, in fact, that was one of the few things under the Spanish and the French that uh, uh, dark-skinned individuals who were, were free, free individuals uh, could become. They could become part of the military. Yeah, they were part of the military. But when you talk about the upper echelon, those individuals who are going to hold high rank, that was usually reserved for the coloreds. At least under the French. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of dark-skinned soldiers, actually. Well, most of the, the Haitian army was dark-skinned. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of like one of the main sources of social tensions in Haiti throughout like the its early period of independence. You had a, a political class that was dominated by uh, mixed-race individuals like, say, um, Alexandre Pétion, uh, Boyard, and all that stuff. And, and that's what made French and the Spanish militaries, I mean, uh, colonialization so different than the British because the British wouldn't allow it. 
but they most certainly did. Uh, the, the, the Spanish and uh, French most certainly did allow it. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm going to take another chance to ask another question. So this is kind of like what um, Duvalier's rule intersects like with several major sort of periods in the history of the Caribbean. You had a first, he first off emerges like during the post-war period of World War II, where kind of like everything is sort of shaken up. He emerges during this period where alongside with uh, Triol, tri 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 uh, I can't pronounce his name. The dictator who ruled over the Dominican Republic. Yeah. And yeah. during the uh, Cuban Revolution, where Castro comes into yeah. power, and then there's this huge confrontation over over um, over the fate of Cuba between the United States and the Soviet Union. I'm sort of wondering how does it, how did De Valier fit in this sort of period, which is kind of very um, unstable in the Caribbean. Um. He was very, well, they were anti-Marxists going back to the 1920s. Um, so they were very anti-communist. So for those of you who don't understand Marxism, Marxism comes out of the work of Karl Marx, who was a German. And he writes a book called uh, Das Kapital, which, and, which is translated into communism. And um, in that theory, they believed that those individuals who were at the bottom of the heap, which would be known as the proletariat, that eventually they would overthrow the industrial class and come to power. Those individuals who were following this particular line of thought that Duvalier and others were following, they sort of, they sort of uh, take it and sort of twist the Marxism a little bit and say, well, the people on the bottom are black and those who are running the state are mulatto they are actually the enemy of the state. So he sort of switches the Marxism around and said that they should be overthrown and that those individuals are the, uh, the ones who are causing all the problems in the country. So yes, he would be anti-Castro because he was anti-communist and, and um, those individuals who fought in the Cuban revolution were socialists and communists in the very beginning, but it's also the nationalist revolution. But as far as he was concerned, they would be individuals who would be enemies to his way of thinking. Um, for the other revolutions were to take place, most of those were nationalist revolts with some form of socialism mixed with some form of Marxism. And for him, that also would be considered, to, to, those individuals also would be contrary to his belief. And if we look at the, uh, places like Ghana and West Africa, Almost all of them were African socialists. They were nationalists, yes, but they were also African socialists. Okay. Okay, so we got another question. Um, Papa Doc doesn't look light skinned. Maybe I missed this. How did he move up in the power structure of Haiti? Oh, okay. he had... no, he, he was black. No, no question. He was a very dark skinned man. No question. Um, it, 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 it's, 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 um... it's, <clears throat> He and other dog skin men who create this philosophy. So how does he move up the political scale? He's a physician. And he happened to uh, uh, be part of a movement in the 1920s where individuals, because he forms his own, he forms, literally forms his own group where people are discussing the issue of what the Americans have done, who they've put in power. Uh, he starts a journal. Uh, in fact, he becomes the editor of a journal. And in that the journal, they're discussing what it means to be black, what it means to be to live in poverty, how they've been uh, stepped on by the Americans, how they've been stepped on by European countries. So he's very aware of, of the underclass, and he holds his allegiance to the dark-skinned people in Haiti. There was a coup which takes place, which he, he had backed. Uh, well, I should say he had spoke out uh, against the individual who overthrew the government. Uh, it's that individual whose government was overthrown where he's actually made the minister of health. So how does he become, become part of uh, politics? He's made minister of health. And once he's part of the government, he begins to uh, expound on the theories which we've discussed here thus far. 
he wants things to change. That's all, it, it, also, all the things which he's discussing in his literature, in his books, as well as his journals, and also as editor of this particular press. And the individuals who are having their work published in his press hold his philosophy. So once he's there as Minister of Health, all the individuals gravitate towards the types of things which you're saying because they, are, they too are dark individuals who can hold no power. All right. Okay, so we have a question about the Totan Makuts. Um, the Totan Makuts have historically been regarded as a terrible force wrecking havoc on the lives of Haitian citizens. Did Devalier have much control of them? I remember hearing that one couldn't even whisper about removing him from power without the Totan but Makuts knocking on their door. Uh, yeah, he did. He did create it. He did create, when he creates the Tutu Makuts, uh, once he becomes president, there is an official military. But he didn't trust them. He, had, he literally did not trust individuals who were in the military. Many of them were light-skinned individuals who held power. And so what he wanted to do was he needed an elite that would follow him. And he knew that it was going to be from the, the average individual, meaning the poor, and most only the poor blacks who had been disenfranchised, downtrodden, and basically stepped upon. So he goes to these individuals and says, well, I need your support. In fact, when he ran for power, they overwhelmingly voted him into power. When he asked, you know, he literally states, I want to be president for life they give him full support. So they had no difficulty when he said, I need protection. I need you to protect me from the enemy of the state. And these are the individuals who are the enemy of the state. They follow through with no difficulty at all. At all. So yes, they did have a reign of terror, if we want to use that term, and that's a great term. In their minds, their individuals who not only wanted to get rid of Duvalier, but to get rid of that strong individual who was giving them some sense of power. And he talks a lot about that, the fact that he wants to give these individual power. And what is power with him? Power was violence. Power came out of that classic Maoist term, out of the barrel of a gun. You don't sit around and talk about it. You, you have your call to action, and most of the time the action meant violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to ask I'm going to ask another question myself. Um, so, you briefly mentioned Kennedy um, embargoing Haiti, but there was like kind of like a, always sort of back and forth going on between Haiti and the United States under Duvalier. Like, there was always like some moments where it saw Duvalier as a sort of counterbalance to uh, Fidel Castro and all that stuff. I, I'm I'm wondering if you could uh, discuss like Duvalier's history of the United States. Yeah. Um... He had a rather contentious relationship with the United States. Um, after Fidel comes to power, I, under I, Eisenhower, from the very beginning, doesn't like him. And uh, when he looks out into the, into the Caribbean, um, what he sees is Duvalier. Now, if you look at the other Caribbean islands, they were also going through uh, various forms of struggle, but most of them were pro Marx. So they were following the Marxist line of revolution to bring their forces to power. Duvalier literally was the only person in the Caribbean who said, I don't like Castro. I would not follow uh, his form of um, revolution. In fact, I'm already in power, so I don't need to. So the Eisenhower administration, and in the very early years, the Kennedy administration, wanted to use his regime as a bulk ward to starve off uh, revolution throughout the rest of the Caribbean. Hmm. That's interesting because um, one of the things I recall like reading about like Kennedy's response to, you know, Duvalier's, you know, dictatorship was that well, Nixon, I think it was actually Nixon, um, don't quote me on this, um, um, the excuse was that they, they were willing to tolerate, say, authoritarianism from Duvalier was because they thought that, okay, African people were inferior and thus prone to being subordinate and incapable of um, living in a democracy and all that stuff. That's how they sort of justified working with Duvalier. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't be uncommon for Nixon, given the, how, the way Nixon saw people. Yeah, that would be very much Nixon. Um, but Kennedy has some problems with them as well. 
Kennedy, Kennedy was a lot more liberal, did not like the suppression which was taking place in Haiti. And he was the first to put an embargo on Haiti. Um, if no other question is going to come up, um, I'm going to ask another one. Um, this is kind of like the beginning like of the sort of mass migration of Haitians abroad into the United States. Like this is where you start seeing a pretty sizable diaspora in the United States. Um, could you maybe describe the sort of community that, that was leaving Haiti um, at this time? Um, this includes an associate of ours at the museum, uh, Patrick Belgate Smith, who, who um, uh, teaches at the University of Milwaukee and has um, actually written a book on his like, you know, father's experience in Duvalier, Haiti and all that stuff. In fact, his father was a person who was targeted and persecuted by Duvalier. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> anyone who was a journalist, anyone who was writing anything that was anti-Duvalier, anyone who uh, spoke out against the regime, anyone who appeared to be a threat, whatever that means, whatever, uh, you know, uh, you appear to be a threat, uh, could very easily be jailed, tortured, and they could lose their lives. Um, so yeah, you, you begin to get individuals making their way out of Haiti by whatever means that they can, and some went to Cuba, and a lot of them came to the United States. Uh, if you had any thought that you were going to try to change the Duvalier regime, um, most certainly was not going to say it. If you were going to leave, you most certainly weren't going to tell anybody except your closest, maybe a family member, and not even then. Some people left and never told their family that they were going to leave at all because they, they didn't trust anyone. What uh, Duvalier was very good at was making people afraid. You're afraid of your neighbor. You might be afraid of your wife or your husband. You're afraid sometimes even of your children who might inform on you if, if, um, um, if he, he had this, this cult, literally this cult of, of uh, everybody was a spy. Everybody was suspect into proving otherwise. And you can inform, you could tell your teacher. Uh, my father said this at, at last night about the regime. And of course the father was taken away. Uh, or the mother was taken away, or the aunt was taken away. So people didn't trust, got to find literally that people trusted no one. You, see, you literally just left as soon as you could get away. You made your plans and then you just simply left, just simply disappeared. Okay. Okay, so we got another question. Um, so who was De Devalier trying to co collaborate with internationally? What was his goal for his people? How was, how was he pro-Black? Right. Um, the only individual that he was actually uh, had all an allegiance to was Haile Selassie. Uh, there weren't other African nations. Like uh, if you look at the revolutions which were taking place during that time, uh, most of them were socialist revolution. Um, you had African socialism. Um, we look at uh, Ghana. We looked at any other na other nations that were coming into their own at that time. They are following this concept of Marxism that had a spin with nationalism of saying we are African people, but at the same time, we need to overthrow the colonial government. And Marx gave a very clear way of doing that. He had, a, he literally had the playbook. And so they mixed and matched and created and it was known as African socialism. Um, and I forget the other part of the question. Um, what was the goal for his people and how was he pro-black? Okay. Uh, um, and, and I think we have to put the, the context in terms of black um, because the, the term changes from place to place. What would be considered pro-black here during that particular time? So if you go back to the 30s, the concept of being black or what was known as negritude was um, that Africa was the seat of human, humankind, that's the place of the birth of all human beings, that Africa was the place whereby inspiration to become a free people and also to liberate Africa, that was the main goal. And so when you look at the early movements like the Back to Africa movement under Garvey, those individuals, and of course Garvey was a very dark skinned man himself, coming from uh, the, the, the Caribbean area, they were, were a back to Africa movement. 
if you want to own your own land, if you want to have your own government, you go back to the birthplace of those individuals from which you came, and that's Africa. That, for them, the Garvey, Garveyites, that was blackness. You also had those, uh, those individuals who believed in um, that to be black was also coming from um, uh, Ethiopia. So you have the Abyssinian brothers, which is a huge group in the United States, and those individuals who followed Haile Selassie. You follow Haile Selassie, then you were considered black. So the term took on different definitions depending on which philosophy you were following. For Duvalier, blackness were those individuals who also followed in the footsteps of, of Haile Selassie. And that is those individuals who were, as far as he was concerned, and in fact, many people were concerned, the Ethiopians were the true Africans, the true black people. Okay. I, I guess uh, one thing I'd like to sort of add is that uh, Devalier was sort of like, a, I, I guess, say cynical when it came to his engagement with the rest of the world. Um, like, for example, he did not really call out, say, I don't know, like the apartheid government in South Africa. No. He, he avoided he avoided doing things that would upset the United States, basically. He had yeah. this sort of very pragmatic view of the Cold War and race relations and all that stuff. All he, he cared about was really just kind of controlling his own sort of, you know. Yeah, and then, and then, and I had said earlier that when you know when they were forming uh, the, an, an ideology back in the twenties and the thirties, they maintained that they did not want Haiti to be that place that the rest of the world looked at and said, okay, you are free people from because of the Haitian revolution and we want to follow you. Those individuals who were doing a riding with Duvalier during the 20s and the 30s were saying, no, we're going to now look inward and we're going to develop Haiti. We're not going to, we don't, we're not going to go outward and say, well, let's extend the revolution to other places as People had looked at Haiti and said, okay, if you could do it, then we can do it, and we would need help. And as we know, Haiti helped a lot of countries become free. Uh, Duvalier says, no, we're going, to, we're going to stay with Haiti, and that's where we're going to, we're not going to go. We're going to turn inwards. Okay. Um, we got another question. Um, just uh, someone wants to clarify, um, was Duvalier a capitalist, or more specifically, did he um, what did he not like about communism or socialism? Um, <clears throat> what he didn't like about communism was the fact that, as far as he was concerned, communism talked about equality of people. So when you look at Marx's work, Marx maintains that all workers of the world should unite, regardless of skin color. For Duvalier, it's only the Blacks. And the individuals who's the, who's the enemy for them, for him, and for those individuals who followed him were, the, were those individuals who were light-skinned mulattoes. So capitalism, so if you're talking about all people of color are workers of the world, then there's no room for the type of ideology and thinking that was created during that particular time that says, well, the enemy of the state is within this particular country. It's not the Europeans, it's the individuals who are following the Europeans. It's, in, it's the individuals who've been put into power by the Europeans and those are the light-skinned Haitians. That's the mulatto class. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the second part of that question was, was he a capitalist or what was his relationship to capitalism? Oh yeah, he, yeah, no question. Um, he was a capitalist uh, and he made no bones about it. Uh, Wherever he could find money, get money, um, he did everything that he could in order to amass fortune. Um, he really felt that uh, the more money that Haiti could have, the stronger the government could become, the more homes that could be bought, uh, the more he could trickle, sort of the trickle down theory that um, those individuals at the bottom could also amass small fortunes themselves. That did not take place, of course. Uh, because there was uh, too much graph in the country, but yeah, he was a capitalist. Yeah, that's sort of ironic because we, you know, he didn't really do anything to sort of challenge the status quo like that 
followed the Haitian occupation. No, he didn't. No. All right. Yeah, I don't really see any questions. Um, feel free to put something in the chat. Um, okay. Um, how did how did Papa Doc set thing the stage for Big Doc? Um, he didn't want his, his dynasty, as he would call it, to end. I mean, it, uh, he felt that it was very natural that uh, if if he passed on or if he became ill, the next person that would be in, uh, that would take power would be his son. Uh, his son is right there next to him, uh, uh, learning the trade. But his son, uh, his son was a very different personality than his father was. He was not as uh, I don't I don't want to use the word savvy. He wasn't as crafty. He wasn't as crafty as his father was. So he was, and many people consider his regime to be somewhat lackluster. But he is trained in in, in terms of how to run a country. Uh, he simply didn't have that type of person. Now, not the one that his father had, in which there was so much endearment uh, to um, his son. Now, years later, people, you know, have, have begun to look back at the uh, back at the Duvalier uh, era, including his son's era, and saying, "Well, uh, things were better then. Um, you know, you you could have as a dark skinned person, you could do things that you could not." have done today and, th and there's some truth to that but uh would i want to see haiti go back to that particular period in which there was so much fear uh no there's a lot of fear now of course there is uh did he keep things under control because the tutamakus made sure that nobody got in his way yeah yeah they made sure that there was no crime there were no gangs during that time they would have been liquidated so uh, is it crime-free? It's crime-free. It's crime-free because if you, you do anything that's going to be, as far as they're considered, as far as they're concerned, would break down the social order that they had established, your fate was sealed. And it could be pretty bad. You know, I've read accounts where people were actually putting in sulfuric so acid. So yeah, he, he had a, a cult of fear. Okay, so we have time for one to two more questions. Um, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll try to at answer what we can. Um, Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Um, it's interesting looking at um, that particular period in which Duval, well, the evolution of Duvalier from an ideological perspective um, and how the ideology of, 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 of what was known as negritude or black nationalism shaped his thinking, uh, particularly after the American occupation of Haiti. Thank you so much, Dr. Knight. I know this has been a very uh, interesting topic to find some information on. You know, you and I have talked offline about this. <laughs> so, and it, it is a very interesting kind of era in, in Haiti as well. And then after Papa Doc, we have Baby Doc and, you know, just kind of the whole, the whole Dua Verde, like, time frame. Um, so I do appreciate um, again, all of your time that you spent on this. And, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, you know, Dr. Knight, I think this is a very good and uh, complicated topic. And so I'm looking forward to continuing to talk about um, Papa Doc, Baby Doc, and kind of everything that happened, not only in Haiti, but around the world um, with them, you know, in, in some future programming. So thank you for, for sharing your insight and your research and your contributions as always. Um, and Ben, thank you so much for uh, another really great and insightful Q&A session. Oh, I think we got one other question, just really quick. Okay, so when you say it was also French, do you mean uh, those individuals who were, who were uh, under the French who were black or French 
in a sense that we're talking about the French elite. So when you say that, um, what are you referring to? Are you, talking, are you are referring to? Oh, oh, Fanon. Uh, no, no question. Uh, uh, that Fanon um, and Martinique uh, believed in it. Yeah, no question. He, in fact, he was one of the major writers. But was he pro Duvalier? No. But yes, he did believe in revolution. And yes, he did believe that the uh, underclass should uh, overthrow the French there. Um, and as we see when he goes to Algeria uh, and, he's, it's, and he participates in the Algerian revolution, those individuals that he sees as the hallmark of the revolution are the poor Algerians. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh... Hi, I'm Nathan. Um, I have another question for you, uh, before you before we wrap things up. So it sounds like, Duval I'm sorry, can you hear me? Sure. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, it sounds like Duvalier didn't have much interest in the Black working poor. It sounds like he was more interested in consolidating his own power and keeping his dynasty so to speak, um, alive and passing it on to his son or his, his own offspring. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm still just a little confused about what his, um, what his aims were. If he wanted well, to he did help those dark skinned blacks. I mean, he did. He really, really uh, felt that they were the salt of the earth. And he did a lot in terms of building clinics, in terms of giving individuals jobs, in terms of building infrastructure. That he did, that is something that he did because uh, he was savvy enough to understand where his power base was, was at. Uh, all the Tutamakuts came from the villages uh, and the small towns. So he understood that by helping them, it also helped him. But even, but from a theoretical perspective, when he's doing his writings in the very early years of the 30s, everyone that's around him, and there were lots of really major writers in Haiti around him, all of them focused on those individuals who were the poor, dark Blacks in Haiti. So all, if you read any of the writings of that particular period, uh, of the painters, the poets, they're all celebrating the dark skin poor Haitians. And in fact, that's a huge movement in Haiti. That does, it was a huge movement even, even in the United States. It was worldwide, really. It was a, really a, a worldwide movement. It's just that what made the Haitian movement different was that within their, their concept of blackness was that the enemy of the state were light-skinned Haitians. And also the fact that the individual that would lead the country was a single individual. And that's what made it different in other forms of black nationalism, which was existing at that time then and now, is that there was always the strong individual. And if that's the person who would lead, that's the person who would define, and that's the person who would hold power. Okay, for sure. Um, so I guess my other question uh, following that is, I guess it's a double, it's two questions in one. So besides the Tonton Maku, um, was there much after the Duvalier uh, dictatorship, was there a larger dark skin black professional class um, that, I don't know. Yeah, just like, was there a, like, was there a professional class after Duvalier? Yeah, I mean, there was a professional class a even during, okay, when you say professional class, are you talking about doctors, lawyers, Indian chief, those, those, Doc you know, those doctors, yeah. lawyers, technicians. Yeah. yeah, in fact, that's what he saw as the, being the middle class. So uh, those individuals, when he, when, and within his writings, we talk talking about the individuals who should, um, uh, be the individuals who carry forth the revolt. There would be the blacks and then there'd be the middle class, but there would be no upper class. So that middle class would be doctors like himself, like himself, 
teachers, technocrats. So you'd have literally only two classes. You'd have an underclass and then you'd have a middle class, but you would have, you wouldn't have a class that was above them and mostly not a class above them that was light skin. So it's oh, all a two tier okay. society. Um, okay, for sure. Um, and so with that, I guess my second question to follow that is um, what, I, I don't know, is like being at the state of Haiti now, um, what, is there much of a black professional class? Um, it doesn't, yeah, there's, there's, there's still, I mean, I some people, a lot of people have come to the United States. There is there, I mean, you still have professors. You've got, you got the universities there. You have school of optometry there. You have a pharmacy school of medicine. I mean, you know, you have universities. So yeah, you have, you have a, a, an upper class that's still there. Yeah, yeah, you do. Everybody didn't leave to come to the United States. Um, there's lots of people who are there who are highly educated, some educated in Europe, uh, some in the United States who went back to Haiti. And the, and the bottom line, even though you, you think about even some of the worst autocratic states, uh, people like their countries. Everybody doesn't immigrate. Uh, some people stay where they're at. Uh, they don't necessarily fight for change. They understand that uh, they can do only as much as they can given certain political situations, but they're there and they do service to people. Thank and you. then if they're doing something, it's not something that's going to be readily known. They're not going to put it in books because they understand the repercussions. They simply do it, uh, as we could say, under uh, concealment. You just do it, but you don't do anything else. Um, hmm. So we have one more question in there we can really just quickly touch on. Um, Dr. Knight, can you talk about the group of Haitian exiles called, oh, I can't. June Haiti, who launched an unsuccessful attempt to overthrow um, Duaver in 1964. Um, Duvalier, because of his, um, I'm trying to think of it, because of the network of individuals who sought to protect him, um, he always had, as they would say, one ear to the ground. Uh, there, were, there was literally no successful group that even got close to overthrowing him. Um, he would either, uh, someone always gave up the group that was attempting to overthrow his regime. And that was also true with this movement. Um, he made sure that his spies were as far, he cast a, a wide net of agents throughout uh, the United States as well as parts of Europe and most certainly within the Caribbean. Um, he had sympathizers also in those countries as well as the United States. And so very early on, he could detect when there were individuals who were going to be harmful to his regime. And that was also, if we want to make a parallel, that was true of Cuba. So um, the individual who uh, sometimes he was contentious with, but sometimes he liked, um, who was overthrown by um, Castro, um, they knew when Castro was headed towards that particular country to overthrow the government put in power by the United States. So as hard as Che Guevara and Castro were, were, were putting themselves together and learning guerrilla warfare to attack the regime that was in power, aboard the ship, the Granada was a spy and they made radio contact with the regime there saying within X number of hours at X, at this particular series of coordinates, these individuals are going to get off the ship and they're going to try to attack you. Well, who's at the shore? The individuals who supported the regime and they were all killed with the exception of Castro, rural Castro, Che Guevara, and maybe five others. So that was also true for this particular group that wanted to launch a rebellion against Duvalier. Uh, he knew they were coming. They had about as much chance as nothing. They, they didn't have a chance. Um, that's, wow. <laughs> that is, 
Wow. I don't even know what to say. That's, that's, that's crazy. Um, I appreciate all those questions. And if anyone does have any additional questions, um, I will be sending a follow-up email and we can connect you with Dr. Knight uh, directly. Um, but again, thank you all for being here this evening, Dr. Knight. Thank you so much for uh, everything you do. If I could just say one thing, I, forget, I, forget, I didn't yeah. mention the name of the, of the person that cash was always, I was telling me to over, overthrow and, um, um, God, his name just went right off my tongue again. How about that? Um, um, God. If you remember, interrupt me. Yeah, cause yeah. Because, yeah, because, you know, all of a sudden, like, there it is, and then I and forgot his name again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he had a rather contentious uh, a relationship with uh, Duvalier, but he also was anti-communist. And and um, was highly repaid, uh, uh, protected by the United States, and the U.S. government had no intentions of allowing um, that particular individual to be overthrown. It, it was really happenstance that Castro was able to come to power. Um, he comes to power, if I can just say this last thing, is with the help of Cuban Haitians, because of lots of Haitians in Cuba. And because of the Afro-Cuban community that made Castro at the beach and, and, and brought them into the Sierra Madres where they're going to fight, uh, mm -hmm. which is why in, in Cuba to this day, Spanish is the first language spoken and the second language is Patois, which is the language spoken by the Haitian population. And Castro said, that's how, you know, for helping me, that's what I would do. So many connections. There are so many connections, similarities, and, and I think that's why it's important. These topics the, and the Haitian diaspora, you know, kind of how it's all all connected in one way or another. So very, very interesting, very cool. Um, oh, doesn't mean to go over time. <laughs> it's all good. It's it's great information, and it's again a very interesting and very complicated, complex topic. So I'm glad we were all able to be here tonight and have some really good conversation, have some really good questions being asked. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. And before we before I let you go, um, I do just have some quick announcements with the museum that I wanted to share with everyone. So uh, October is Crayola Month and the museum is celebrating with a free five week Haitian proverb and conversation class. Um, this course is for folks who have a basic understanding of Haitian Creole and those who want to dive deeper into some Haitian sayings, the proverbs, and then also have the opportunity to do a little bit of practicing um, with some conversation with other folks in the group. So if you're looking to join that, you wanna be a part of that, you can find that registration link on our social media and our website. Again, it's a free five-week course. Um, it's meeting weekly, once one hour per session um, over Zoom, and that will be starting on October 14th. Additionally, on October 17th, the museum will be bringing its traveling exhibition, We Walk, a celebration of Black community to North Lawndale. Um, this is going to be another free event open to the public. We're going to have some more details about that coming very, very soon. And then lastly, Hammock's next in-person exhibition will be opening next week on Friday. And this exhibition is based around the recent earthquakes and tropical storm in Haiti. Um, we were going to do a different topic, but because of just recent events, we wanna make sure um, that this is a call to action and a reminder that Haitian folks are still dealing with the aftermath aftermath of all the events that have been happening in the country. And we want to make sure that we continue to keep all these topics on people's minds as it falls out of the media. So really some really great things happening at the museum. Make sure to keep up with us on social media. Um, make sure to keep up with us online. Um, but again, thank you all for being here tonight. I'll be sending up a follow-up email with some additional information. We will also have this recording on our YouTube um, in a couple weeks too. So if you want to go back and, and revisit some of the questions is, or share it with your friends. Um, so again, on behalf of Hammock and our team, everyone have a wonderful evening and we look forward to having you at one of our programs in the future. Thanks so much everyone for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Take care.